a lot of people say that I sound more Anglican than I do Reformed. So if that's true, why am I not just like Anglican? Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christianity and run away from creepers. Uh, I'm gonna have to fix that. I'll do it later. So today I'm gonna be talking about why I'm not Anglican, despite often sounding like one. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm very high church as far as Presbyterians go. In case you don't know what high church means, it means making churches look like this rather than looking like a barn house. And, um, <laughs> I'm being sarcastic, there's way more to it than that. It also involves, like, being more liturgical, caring more about the sacraments, and generally Anglicans are more high church than Presbyterians, and I'm very high church for a Presbyterian, so why am I not just Anglican? Another thing is that Anglicans have a tendency to be very eclectic, meaning they try to take the best from many different Christian traditions. And that's something I try to do a lot, too. I, um... Take the, try to, like, learn what I can from, you know, Lutherans, Catholics, Baptists, and yes, I do learn from Baptists, even though I always pick on them. I, I still love you guys if you're a Baptist watching this, I just, you know, can't help but roast you, because you're the ones who get least mad at me for it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if that's all true, why am I not Anglican? So, Anglicanism has many um, different streams within it, like I said. So, there's not one, like, core document that sums up all of Anglicanism. There are Reformed Anglicans, whose theology is much more similar to mine, basically identical to mine, honestly, um, and that's summed up in the 39 Articles, which is one of their confessions. But there's also a lot of Anglo-Catholics, who are basically just Catholics, but more likely to be gay. Okay, I know it's, I know it's way more than that, I'm, I'm picking on everyone today. Anglo-Catholics um, are very similar to Catholics in many ways, and they often don't even like to call themselves Protestants, um, but they, um, they're not under the authority of the Pope, and they're still part of the Anglican tradition, so they do have their own distinctive styles and stuff. The reason I said the gay thing is because um, they, uh, the Church of England is open to like same-sex marriage, and I, I, I know my denomination is also open to that, which is a problem, so that's not um, something I, I, I have the right to pick on them for. But the only reason I said that is if you see someone who's dressed like a Catholic priest, but who's also like, you know, a, a lesbian, it's it had, just by process of elimination, it has to be like an Anglo-Catholic because um, the Catholic and Orthodox churches would, would never be okay with that. And it's a problem in Protestantism that all Protestant denominations, whether Presbyterian, Anglican, Baptist, Methodist, have a branch that's very liberal. But yeah, so um, there's Anglo-Catholic, there's Reformed Anglican. And the Reformed Anglicans are basically identical in theology to me. And, but by the way, um, obviously not all Anglo-Catholics are liberal. It's just that um, there is a very liberal strand of Anglo-Catholicism, which doesn't exist for just Catholicism to nearly the same extent. That's all I meant to say. Anyway, um, I, I, I make edgy jokes, but then I have to spend like five minutes clarifying them so that I don't get like a bunch of keyboard warriors typing in all caps. Um, so the... Uh, Reformed Anglicans are basically theologically identical to me. So my disagreement with Anglicanism, especially in the Reformed end, isn't really theological. And neither is neither is the problem that Anglicans are permitting of other are permissive of like a variety of theological opinions, because I also like that way of doing things. And my problem with Anglicanism isn't the fact that they're high church, because I'm very high church myself. Now, one of the few issues I'm kind of low church on is I'm against images of Christ. I'm not a strict iconoclast, I call myself more of an iconoskeptic. But what we do in Reformed Church is we have the Cairo symbol to depict, to represent Christ, not depict, to represent Christ, and we don't have any actual images of Christ, because the Second Commandment says you shouldn't have images of God, and we consider an image of Christ to be an image of God, because Jesus is God. Um, I especially bring that up when people call the Reformed Nestorians for separating, they, they think we separate Jesus' humanity and divinity. It's like, no, that's, we're against images of Christ because we know that Jesus in his humanity is still God. Um, so yeah, that's, that's like the only theological issue I can think of, strictly theological issue, that I would 
disagree with Anglicans on, but it's not a strongly held belief of mine, and I'm not strictly against icons, I'm just slightly against it. Um, as as a good reform, the good reformed dude that I am. But, um, so yeah, obviously, the main issue that separates Presbyterians and Anglicans is church government. The name Presbyterian, which is what I am, refers to our um, method of government, and the form of government that Anglicans use is called the Episcopal government. Now, in America, the um, mainline Anglican church is called the Episcopal church, but really, um, Anglicans, Catholics, and Eastern Orthodox, and like some Lutherans and Methodists even, use an Episcopal form of government. So it's not just, it's not just the Episcopal Church USA that can be called Episcopal in some sense. However, I'm not really aware of many non-Presbyterian groups that use a Presbyterian form of government. But yeah, so there's there are several reasons I prefer a Presbyterian form of government over um, an Anglican, or I guess you could call it the Episcopal government. Now, I don't think an Episcopal government is wrong. The Presbyterian view of church history, which seems to be accurate based on the writings of people like St. Jerome, is that the early church was Presbyterian in terms of its govern government. I'm not saying the early church was like five-point Calvinists. I, I don't think they were not Calvinist either. I, I think that that issue wasn't really talked about. The early church does seem to have been run in a Presbyterian manner. In the Bible, um, the words elder and bishop seem to be used interchangeably, and St. Jerome says that elder was identical with bishop until people began seeking power, and over time, this idea that the bishops began getting more power relative to the elders until it eventually evolved into the papacy in the West. And um, so obviously Anglicans wouldn't go that far. But what they've ended up developing is arguably worse in some ways, especially with the Church of England. I'll get into that. Um, but yeah, so there's... Um, if you're just setting up a church government based on the Bible, um, it seems to be a, a Presbyterian form of government. Pres the word presbyter means elder. So Presbyterian government means the church is run by elders, and what that does is it makes sure that no one man can have too much power. It's basically accountability is built into the Presbyterian system of government, and that's why I don't, I haven't done my research here. This is just based on vague observations. But it is kind of why the Presbyterian churches have the least case, the least, are, are the least likely to have cases of abuse. Everyone knows the scandals that have gone on in the Catholic Church. Now, obviously, the Catholic Church isn't unique as an institution for having problems like that, because statistically, um, those types of incidents are way more hap um, way more likely to happen in an elementary school, in a public school, than in the Catholic Church. As far as churches go, they're the ones that have gotten famous for it. But also the Southern Baptist Church, um, which is um, has a completely different form of government, also had that issue. So it seems like the Catholic and Baptist government structures are on opposite ends, because the Catholic structure is the most hierarchical that you could imagine, and the Baptist structure is completely non-hierarchical. The Baptist form of government is, for the most part, congregationalism, <coughs> which means that each church basically is run by the pastor, and um, there's no like real hierarchy between churches. They can churches can fellowship with each other like they do in the Southern Baptist Convention and things like that, but there's um, not really a hierarchy. So Presbyterians do have a hierarchy, because it's not just each individual church run by elders. The um, elders of each church send representatives to, like, higher councils, to, like, presbyteries and synods and the general, assemb the general assembly at the highest level. So Presbyterians do have a hierarchy, unlike Baptists, but unlike Catholics, it's more of a bottom-up hierarchy than a top-down hierarchy. And I'm, I'm sort of lumping in Catholics and Episcopals here, because they have a similar form of government, it's just that Episcopals don't have a Pope, so they're better than that in that sense, but I'll, I'll talk about um, the whole Church of England thing. Um, so they're, um, they're, it's it seems like a moderate position, but I think... On either end of our more moderate position, there can be cases of people abusing their power. Because if you have a strict uh, top-down hierarchy, it's so easy for uh, people higher up to like just cover up their mistakes, because not many people are holding them accountable. And that's why so many of the abuse scandals in the Catholic Church were covered up. 
it's it's what I call the Hillary Clinton effect, right? Where covering up a scandal is more scandalous than the scandal. It's like um, the reason everyone hated Hillary Clinton so much it was because not just the she sent some emails, but that she deleted them, which got everyone to um, be way more suspicious of her. So um, if there's a, a top-down hierarchy, then a lot of that corruption can happen. However, if there's no hierarchy, and then each past individual pastor can kind of do like whatever the heck he wants with his congregation, and this is sort of a um, a, a broadly conservative way of thinking that hierarchy is inevitable. So if you try and avoid hierarchy, then there a hierarchy will develop anyway, but it won't be a regulated one. So it's it's kind of like it's kind of like a power vacuum. And that is what happens in a lot of Baptist churches. They don't have a formal hierarchy, but there ends up being celebrity pastors, which I think is worse than just having a hierarchy. And that's why a lot of celebrity pastors um, can get away with abuse in something like the Southern Baptist Convention. There was a big abuse scandal in the Southern Baptist Convention because there's not that much hierarchy. Um, I mean, there's not, sorry. Of course, there's not much um, accountability built into the structure of, like, um, Baptist church government. So I think Presbyterian government has the best accountability because no one man can ever get that much power. We don't have a pope, we don't have bishops, we just have councils of, of elders, basically. And again, I can't do my research to show that statistically Presbyterian churches are the least likely to have any abuses of power. Um, it's just, it seems to make sense. So yeah, if you ask my source, my source is, it seems to make sense to me. If that's not good enough for you, then deal with it. I'm just a YouTuber anyway. So, um, now we'll talk about the, the Church of England. So, I love Anglicans. If I wasn't Presbyterian, the, the closest thing, aside from, like, Dutch Reformed, would be Reformed Anglican, and... I don't know, I sound a lot like Anglicans all the time, so I love you guys, but you gotta admit, you guys have a really embarrassing origin story. So there's the whole thing with King Henry VIII. The reason the- I know that theologically the father of the Church of England is Thomas Cranmer, not um, King Henry VIII. I know King Henry VIII was theologically completely Catholic, but it still was a consequence of King Henry VIII's behavior that the Anglican Church, the Church of England at least, came into existence. Came into existence because he was horny and he wanted to divorce his wife. Basically. And I know there's way more depth to the character of King Henry VIII than that, but it was it was a very embarrassing origin story. So basically, in case you're not familiar with the whole story of King Henry VIII, by the way, I'm no historian, so I know a lot of you British history geeks, including Redeem Zoom or Third Wheel, if you're watching this, um, a lot of British history geeks are gonna point out all the million errors I'm going to make here, but um, basically King Henry VIII thought he had good reason to divorce his wife. He asked the Pope if he could annul his marriage. The Pope said no. So King Henry was like, actually, you know, in the in the Bible, um, King David was above the um, priests, so maybe the head of the church should be the king rather than the Pope. So King Henry VIII basically made himself the head of the church. And to this day, that legacy still remains in which the King of England is officially the head of the Church of England. So, the Church of England, which is the centerpiece of the global Anglican Church, of Anglicanism globally, I know that there's like the whole GAFCON thing when the ANCA, which is not connected to the Church of England, but generally speaking, the global hub of Anglicanism is the Church of England, and it's right now run by King Charles, who is, for, as far as we can guess, is not really a Christian. So the head of the Church of England is clearly not a Christian. I know the, head, the heads of my denomination probably aren't Christians either. But just in theory, the idea of a secular king ruling over the Church is really not something I'm a fan of. I think there's zero biblical precedent for that. It's like... Here's how I'd explain the King David thing. Um, it's not what God wanted to happen. The, what it was before, like, before the King Saul was appointed in the Bible, the judges um, were in charge, and the judges can kind of be compared to presbyters. They were like elders. 
And the whole point of not having a king was because God is king. And um, that's, that's what Presbyterians think, is that Jesus is king and the elders just submit to his kingship. So, yeah, we do have a king, but it's not an earthly king. There should be no earthly king over the kingdom of God because the only king of the kingdom of God is God, is Jesus, right? So the idea of, I know not all Anglicans would um, agree with this philosophy, and I, again, I, I might be totally misrepresenting it, but the idea of having a secular king over the church is really unsettling. And that's why Presbyterians thought of the idea of separation of church and state. Now, I want to clarify, separation of church and state does not mean separation of religion and state. Religious ideas can and should and always will influence the state. Like, um, a lot of, like, liberal progressive people say, oh, um, separation of church and state means you can't be pro-life because if you're pro-life, it's for religious reasons and that you can't force your religion on me. It's like... Everyone believes what they believe due to their religion or lack thereof. Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement and may and caused laws to be made based on his religious views. I know his religious views weren't like or Christian orthodoxy. He had many heretical views, but it still stands that he did have religious views that did influence the political change he caused. And I don't think um, most liberal progressives are going to be against Martin Luther King. Um, Martin Luther King using his religious views to do that. So it's like you can only use your religious views if you're liberal. So separation of church and state in the context of like the Constitution or, or in the context of Presbyterians. The U.S. Constitution was actually inspired based on Presbyterian government, by the way. Fun fact. So as an, I'm being a patriotic American. I'm just kidding. Um, so... Um, yeah, the separation of church and state does not mean separation of religious ideas and state. It's more so to protect the church from the state than to protect the state from the church. Because in the Middle Ages, there was this sort of circular power dynamic between the Pope and the, and the secular kings, basically. The Pope um, often told the, the secular kings what to do, yes, but almost as frequently, the secular kings would tell the Pope what to do, and people would be given super high positions in the church, obviously as political favors. And it, um, so much so that in the Middle Ages, the church, the church of God, was called the pornocracy by the people because of how ridiculously corrupt it had gotten. And part of the, um, the main motivation for separating church and state was to deal with the corruption of the church. It was to protect the church. It was not some sort of liberal idea of we need to protect the state from religion. It wasn't that at all. Um, yeah, it was it was to purify the church and make sure that the... Because politics will always be dirty, no matter what we do. So it's trying to protect the church from the disgustingness of politics, of earthly politics. Earthly politics are necessary. It's kind of like cleaning the toilet. It's necessary. It's, it's not pretty, though. And they want the church to be pretty. Like... So uh, that's why we don't want to mix the church itself with politics, although ideas that come from the church absolutely can and should influence politics, because they always have, whether we like it or not. Um, and before it was the church, it was whatever religion the people had, whether it was paganism or, um, I don't know, Islam always influences the political decisions of countries that um, are Islamic, even um, countries like Turkey that, on paper, are secular governments and like even in Europe where like most people are not religiously Christian anymore there still are Christian parties p Christian political parties that um, make policies based on Christian social teachings and honestly I like those the policies of those parties better than the Democratic or Republican parties but politics isn't my specialty so if I look more into it I might totally change my mind and I probably will um, dang I can't sleep there's monsters uh, where? I don't see the monsters, though. Maybe maybe it's just they're, the monsters are in my head. Um, now, so the separation of the church and the state is very important to Presbyterians, and it's, it's important to, to me, frankly, because I think the church needs to be independent from the state, and the state should never tell the church what to do. In the Church of England, you literally have 
the state being above the church. So you literally have part of the kingdom of God being told what to do by one of the kingdoms of this world. And once again, I know not all Anglicans are part of the Church of England or endorse the hierarchy of the Church of England. Now, when the head of the Church of England was Queen Elizabeth II, it was pretty cool because Queen Elizabeth was definitely a Christian. She went to church every um, every every Sunday, and a lot of people assume she was kind of liberal because her Christmas addresses were sort of all-inclusive and weren't like a John MacArthur sermon, so people assume she must be liberal. But no, she she invited Billy Graham to preach at her church, and she invited Sinclair Ferguson to preach. Like, she even commented sometimes that she liked uh, Presbyterian worship more than um, uh, the really high church Anglican stuff. So, yeah, by by all accounts, Queen Elizabeth was super religious. I I've, I'm, I have to verify this. I've heard a quote from her saying that she hoped uh, Jesus would return in her lifetime so she could cast her crown at his feet. So, yeah, Queen Elizabeth II was awesome. And, like, now that she's gone, it's like England doesn't really have that much to brag about. So it, it's really embarrassing if, you know, the head of your church is King Charles. But may, maybe a bit less embarrassing than whoever's in charge of my church. Like, the Presbyterian Church USA, it's just run by a general assembly. We have a stated clerk who's obviously a, a heretic for us. But he's not like the Pope or anything. He's just he's just the, like a sort of like sort of a speaker for the House kind of thing because the the U.S. Congress was inspired by Presbyterianism. Um, but the PCUSA, what's what's wrong? What's going wrong with the PCUSA now? It's a bug. It's not a feature. It's a bug because um, we do have Christian Orthodoxy in our Book of Confessions. That has not changed. But because a lot of conservatives ran away from the PCUSA. The liberals hijacked it, but um, because the PCUSA is dying out, if conservatives just come back to it, we can easily retake it. Um, however, in the in Anglicanism, it's a feature that church and state are not separate, and the Presbyterians were called the dissenters in England for not submitting to their hierarchy and for strictly separating church and state, in institutionally speaking. Once again. Um, not, like, ideologically. And I'm also not on board with, like, this is a legitimate Presbyterian opinion that I don't agree with. I'm not on board with the whole, like, radical two kingdoms thing that people like Michael Horton teach. I love Michael Horton in, like, every single way except this. Um, radical two kingdoms basically says that, um, the church has basically, um, nothing to do with redeeming culture. It's basically just about, um saving souls here and here and now and I would definitely not agree with that. But at the same time I'm not also not one of those theonomy people. I'm not someone who th believes we should have a theocracy. I think we should have a secular government but not a secular culture. I th ideally what we have is a Christian culture run by a secular government and secular doesn't mean atheist. Secular just means not explicitly religious. Just the way that um, I don't know my I, I use secular toothpaste when I brush my teeth. That doesn't mean I'm a secular person. Like, my computer is a secular computer. There's not like a, a huge cross painted on it. But I'm using my secular computer to make a, 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 a church in, in a Minecraft world, for example. So yeah, the main reason why I'm not Anglican, it's very simple. Separation of church and state. And honestly, you, pr you guys probably could have heard me say that instead of this whole 20 minute spiel. Okay guys, I'm just going to speed this up while I um, build some of the rest of these uh, paths in the garden.